All right, tonight I want to ask you one question. Are you spiritually mature? You can be like, well, you know, I'm, I'm in middle school, so I'm not mature. Oh, whoa, this is very touchy. Uh, are you spiritually mature? Think about this. Are you, yourself, not your neighbor, not your self from six months ago, not yourself from two years ago, are you spiritually mature where you are? Could you confidently say, yeah, I'm growing in maturity rather than immaturity in my walk with the Lord? That's the question I want you guys to focus on right now. Uh, tonight, as we go through this. So we're talking about spiritual immaturity versus maturity. Hebrews 5.11 is where we're going to start out tonight. So if you guys have your Bibles or have a Bible on your phone, you can use that. It's okay. We're going to open up to Hebrews 5, verse 11. Once I find it. Come on, Hebrews. There you are. Okay. Are you a spiritually mature person? Let's read Hebrews, Hebrews 5, starting in verse 11. About this we have much to say, and it is hard to explain, since you have become dull of hearing. For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again the basic principles of the oracles of God. You need milk, not solid food. For everyone who lives on milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness, since he is a child. But solid food is for the mature, for those who have their powers of discernment trained by constant practice to distinguish good from evil. Let's stop right there. So we have chapter 5, verse 11. The writer begins with, uh, begins with, about this we have much to say. You're probably like, what the heck is he talking about? About this, about what? So the start of Hebrews 5, the writer, he's talking about the high priests of that day. And he's, he's just explaining how the high priests, the high priests come, they're chosen from among men, verse 1, and they act on behalf of men in relation to God. So they're basically the spiritual leaders. They're like the pastors back in the day. And he's trying to explain to the Hebrew people, he's like, he's trying to explain to them what does it look like to be a spiritual leader? How, how do you be someone like this? And right off the bat, he's like, Verse 11, about this we much to say, and it's hard to explain, because you've become dull of hearing. There's four attitudes of immaturity we see in verses 11 through 14 that I'm going to point out to you. First one, we become dull of hearing. What the heck does dull of hearing mean? Now the word dull in um, verse 11 translates to the same word in Hebrews chapter 6, verse 12, uh, called sluggish. And the writer says, he says, don't be sluggish. So this word, this word dull translates the same thing that the writer at the end of our passage is going to be like, don't go back to this. Don't be like this. So this is a big deal. We become dull of hearing. The people were senseless to the word of God is what he's trying to say. So imagine I have my water bottle here and it's empty. And I just ran a marathon. So I'm like, dude, you need water, right? So I have my water bottle and I go up to the water fountain, this the flow of water. I go and put my water bottle under the flow of water, but my water bottle has a huge gaping hole in the bottom of it. So I go over there and I put my water bottle under it, it's empty. The water's going in the top of the water bottle and comes straight out the bottom. And I see it and I'm like, I can see this, this basically knowledge, if you look back to what they're talking about in Hebrews, I can see the knowledge going in, but I'm so dull to the fact that there's a hole in the bottom of my water bottle that I don't, I don't care. So it's like the people were senses the word of God. They let the, all their teaching go in one ear and go out the other ear. So the first sign of someone who's spiritually immature means they're dull of hearing. Second sign, they forgot. We forget all the time. I, I want to mention something actually about this first one. How many of you have been raised in the church? Basically all of us, right? <laughs> Me too. This is so easy for all of us. And I'm not trying to say that everyone becomes like this, being raised in the church, but for all of us, it's, it's so easy to become dull of hearing. When you hear the gospel every day, every Sunday and every Wednesday, and you're, you're hearing people talk to you about what they're learning in the Bible all the time. It's so easy to be that guy who sits in the corner and just is glazed over, and they, they, don't, they don't care about God's word. And I write saying right off the bat, that's, that's not a good sign if you're trying to be someone who's maturing in your faith. The second attitude of spiritual maturity, like I said, is we forget. 
verse 12, he said, you need someone to teach you again the basic principles of the oracle of God. Well, what are the basic principles of the oracle of God? Basic principles of our faith, John 3.16, right? For God so loved the world that whoever gave, that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish and have eternal life. He's saying, you guys forgot this. You need someone to teach you again. So if I have someone up here who plays basketball, is really good at basketball, and he tells me, yeah, I can play basketball, I ask him, how do you do that? And he can't explain to me the things he needs, how big the teams are, how to win, how to lose. He can't explain to me his sport unless he has his coach in his ear just whispering him all the answers. He's saying these believers were like that. They need someone to teach them again their faith. They couldn't hold up their faith as their own because they were forgetting the basic principles of the Christianity that they claimed um, to have. Add to number three. Uh, Warren Rearsbury Warren Rearsbury said it best when he said they're living on the baby food diet. <laughs> so imagine you have you have a kid who is in second grade. So he learns ABCs when he's in kindergarten, maybe first grade, he's a little late learning his ABCs. But he's in second grade and he can finally read a children's story, right? He can read a children's story and he's so proud of himself or herself. And he's like, guys, I can read a children's story, I'm good for the rest of my life. Anybody ask me to read? I'll just keep practicing this children's story. It's like living off of baby food. What, what good does that do? Is that going to help you grow if you're just staying on that baby stuff? How are you ever going to mature if you, if you never stop feeding off of that milk? And we know these people were true Christians, so you can't say, well, they're living on milk because they're, they're newly born Christians. It says in verse 12, by now you ought to be teachers. So they were at the age of maturity, spiritually, spiritually speaking. Saying, so they were saved, say, two, three years, and you're at the age, but you're choosing to still stay on that milk, that, that beginning food for a believer. So sign number three for being spiritually immature is you're living on a baby food diet. You're not choosing to go beyond that. Sign number four, this is a big one, no constant practice. Look at verse 14. He's saying the solid food is for the mature. So these mature people that he's, um, that our writer is referring to, he's saying they have their powers of discernment trained by constant practice. You're a Christian, and you're saying, I want to be mature, but you don't have the constant practice of being in the Word, praying, confessing sin. Um, you're never going to actually truly mature. It's like you get Michael Jordan up here, and I'm... I'm interviewing him, and the first thing I ask him is, how, how were you so good at basketball? How did you get so good at basketball? What would he say? Harrison, what would he say? Practice. Practice. Amen. Constant practice. This is right there. You don't become a pro basketball star because you shoot one basket every week, right? <laughs> He's got a constant practice. Same thing with our faith. If we don't have a constant practice, even when it feels dull, even when we're tempted to be dull of the teaching that we're hearing in, in church, and we're not bringing that into our own individual lives throughout the week, if you don't have that practice, you cannot expect yourself to mature. So that's our fourth, that's our fourth attitude of being immature. So number one, they're dull of hearing. Number two, they forgot their faith. They couldn't hold up their faith as their own. Number three, they're choosing to live off of baby food. Number four, there's no constant practice. Um, so, going into chapter 6, chapter 5, verses 11 through 14, gave us that, that initial um, introduction, kind of, of what does a spiritually immature person look like? What are we trying to move out of? Because this is our default. Our default is all of those four things. To not be attracted to the Word of God, to not even be Christians because we're born into sin. It's like saying, this is where we all start, and that's okay. But why, why are we trying to move out of it? So in chapter 6, verses 1 through 12, we see that call to maturity. So let's go into chapter 6. I'm going to read verses 1 through 12. It says, Therefore, let us leave the elementary doctrine of Christ and go on to maturity. There you go. Not laying again a foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God. 
and of instruction about washings and the laying on of hands, the resurrection of the dead, and eternal judgment. And this we will do if God permits. For it is impossible in the case of those who have once been enlightened, tasted the heavenly gift, and have shared in the Holy Spirit, and have tasted the goodness of the word of God and the powers of the age to come, and then have fallen away to restore them again to repentance, since they are crucifying once again the Son of God to their own harm and holding him up to contempt. Verse 7. For a land that has drunk the rain that often falls on it and produces a crop useful to those for whose sake it is cultivated receives a blessing from God. But if it bears thorns and thistles, it is worthless and near to being burnt. Near to being cursed, its end is to be burned. Though we speak in this way, yet in your case, beloved, we feel sure of better things, things that belong to salvation. For God is not unjust so as to overlook your work and the love that you have shown for his name in serving the saints as you still do. And we desire each one of you to show the same earnestness to have the full assurance of hope until the end, so that you may not be sluggish but imitators of those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. So we went through the signs of immaturity. Now let's go through the attitudes and the signs of spiritual maturity um, that our writer just put out for us. So the first way that our writer tells us to, to be spiritually mature is what? Is it to move on from the elementary doctrine? No, you need to lay that foundation. You need to have the elementary doctrine to start out. You can't be a Christian and say you are living for the Lord if you've never had a time in your life when you've repented of your sin and truly humbled yourself before God, saying, God, I am naturally a sinner, and I'm not yours. So please forgive me of the sin that I've done. Jesus died on the cross for me, right? That's the foundation that has been laid. And the reason I say this is because it's telling us not to, not laying again the foundation, right? So he's not like, don't, don't move on from the foundation because it's not important. The important part is the foundation. If you have a house and you're building the house and no one lays that concrete at the bottom and you're trying to build all these walls and air ducts and stairs on the ground, <laughs> on the grass, is that going to stand? Nope. No, of course not, <laughs> right? So you have to lay that foundation first. But if you lay the foundation and then lay another foundation and another one, what are you going to have? You're going to have a blob of cement. Right? So don't be a senseless, just blob cement, so to say, trying to lay a foundation of the Christian faith over and over again. It's not about praying a prayer and then praying the prayer again and praying the prayer again. No, Christ died once for sins. He died once for sins, so we don't need to go through that process every, like all the time. No, that, that's, that doesn't make sense. So first sign of being mature is truly becoming a Christian, laying the foundation. So I shared my story last week. Um, if you guys were here, and a little part of me, and big part of my story, the biggest part of everyone's story is when they, when they became saved, right? When they accepted Christ. And the big thing for me was I thought I had laid the foundation. I thought I was saved because my parents went to church, and I grew up in church, and I was reading the Bible, but I didn't understand any of it. Um, so my big thing was I thought I had done this, but when I realized I had never truly told anyone about my sin or gone to God just totally broken over my sin, that's, that's like the big thing for any of us, for all of us, is recognizing, okay, have I done this? If, I'm a, if I say I'm a Christian, what was the time that you did this? What was the time that you initially said, God, I'm a sinner, and I need you. Sign number two. Um, oh, first John 1, 9. There you go. We confess our sins. He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. Cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's the gospel. You don't have to be afraid. We, we sang a song last week called Stand Your Love. We don't have to fear when it comes to God's love. We don't have to fear punishment when we tell him what we've done wrong, he, he gives us grace, right? And he gives us all the mercy that we don't deserve. <laughs> so don't be afraid when I say, confess your sins to the Lord, because he, he loves to do that for us and change us. First sign, lay the foundation, and you will start to be mature. Um, yeah, this is a quote that I have. It's not bad to be immature, right? 
This is the default. The default was verses five, verses eleven through fourteen, chapter five. That's what we said, and that's not bad. You know, that is bad. That's sin, but it's not bad to admit because we were all there at one point. But it is bad to stay in immaturity forever. You can't live on baby food forever. You can't be thirty years old and eating a literal can of baby food. Every single day, every single morning for breakfast, expect yourself to actually grow like a normal human, right? We can't expect to grow like normal Christians if we're trying to live like we don't even know the gospel that we preach to ourselves. Second sign of being spiritually mature, continued repentance. Um, verses 4 through 6, it says, for, for it is impossible in the case of those who have once been enlightened. So you're saying you're a Christian, you've truly been born again. It says, so those who have been saved and then have fallen away, to restore them again to repentance. This verse isn't saying that if you're saved and you have a sin struggle, there's no way back. That's not what this verse is saying. That's what some people see because they take it out of context and don't read the end. So what does the end say? It's impossible for them to be restored since they are crucifying once again the Son of God to their own harm and holding him up to contempt. Who knows what contempt means? Anyone? Yeah, I, I, I didn't know them that either. So, I looked it up. What does contempt mean? Contempt is basically overlooking something that should be important. So it's saying, these people, it's impossible. If you're saved, and you say, I have a sin struggle, and I can't grow, because I'm, I will never grow out of it. If you're saying that, and you're truly saved, yeah, you will never grow out of that, because... With that attitude, you're overlooking the fact that Jesus, 1 Peter um, 3.18, died once for sins. Jesus died once for sins. And if you're born again, God just asks you to continually be repentant and confessing to him that you can't save yourself. <laughs> you know, so the second, second sign of being spiritually mature is that constant, continued repentance. Because we sin every day, but God paid for that sin. Jesus paid for that on the cross. The third sign, don't expect to grow if you're not willing to repent. Amen. Don't ex okay, the third sign is spiritual maturity. Fruits produced. How many of you guys have heard of fruit of the Spirit? Fruit of the Spirit, right? Who can say it? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Yeah, good. Yeah, they're still, still waiting. Um, verses 7 and 8 of chapter 6 is talking about the land that drinks the rain. It produces two kinds of fruit. Either it produces a crop useful to those, and it's a blessing from God, or it produces it bears thorns and thistles. As normal humans, we produce thorns and thistles all the time. If you don't admit that, you, you have to. <laughs> I've fallen in the trap of not wanting to admit the thorns, the sins that I'm, that I'm producing in my life. So, sign number three of being spiritually mature is you produce the fruit of the Spirit. Over, not you, it's not you only produce the fruit of the Spirit, but the fruit of the Spirit should um, character, categorize your life more than the fruit of your sin. Is what I'm trying to say. So yeah, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Why do I have faithfulness, bolded and underlined? Big important word there. I have it underlined because that should be the first thing that people see when you've laid that foundation, when you've repented of your sin. First thing people should see in you when you become a Christian is faithfulness. Are you faithful to the commitment that you've made to the Lord? People see, yeah, this guy has a desire to, this girl has a desire to be reading God's word outside of church, outside of Wednesday nights. You say, they, I see a desire in them to pray on their own, or even just pray at the dinner table, you know? Do people see a faithfulness about you that's not a faithfulness to the love of your flesh, but it's faithfulness to the love of this God who's, who has saved you and um, paid for your sin and given you grace? First thing people should see in you is faithfulness. Um, and here's an encouragement, guys. Warren Wearsbury, I can't say it today. One Wearsby, there we go. He said in his commentary on this passage, he says, Note that the thorns 
then the briars, the thorns and the thistles, are burned, not the field. God never curses his own. The thorns and the thistles are burned, not the field. We're the field in verses 7 and 8. And the writer's saying, you produce good things, you produce bad things. And God doesn't want to crush us when we produce the bad things. God doesn't look at us and say, oh, he said he's not a child of mine anymore. I'm going to smite him out of the ground. No. God wants to burn the thorns and thistles off of us. He wants to burn that sin that prevents us from doing good things for his name and being um, seen as lights in this dark world. He wants to burn them off. So we can glorify him. So don't be afraid to, going back to number two and number one, repenting of your sin, so God will um, just free you of that. Because that's what he wants to do in the long run. He doesn't want to, he doesn't want to destroy you. He wants you to, he wants to bring you back to him. Um, so we, we saw the first characteristics was, or the first fruit we produce is the good fruit, right? The fruit of the Spirit. What's the other type of fruit? What do thorns and thistles look like in our lives? Well, you have Proverbs. If you guys have ever read Proverbs, you see uh, a man, just anyone called a fool, is described. Fools hate knowledge in Proverbs 1. They hate, they have no pleasure in understanding in chapter 18. Enjoy wicked schemes in chapter 10. They're crooked in speech. They're quick-tempered. These are all things that are natural to us because we're sinful, because we're born into sin. So when you think um, there's, there's two types of fruit, it is the fruit of the Spirit that comes from God and the Holy Spirit living inside of us, and then there's the fruit of our natural worldly sin. Um, which, is more, which fruit is more of a pattern in your life? That is a question I have to ask myself all the time. Which fruit is more of a pattern in my life? Is it that fruit of the Spirit? Going back, there they are. Love, joy, peace, patience. Is it the fruit that Jesus literally perfected in his life on earth? Is that more of a pattern in my life? Or is it more of the pattern of, yeah, I'm quick-tempered. Yeah, I'm out of control with my speech. Yeah, I, I hate it when people correct me. But do I think I know everything on my own? Um, that's something we need to be asking ourselves. Which kind of fruit are you producing? So I have this great illustration of green beans, green beans in my, in my mind here. Green beans are an amazing Iowa garden fruit, right? Yeah. Amen. Who, who here loves green beans? Sam Hammond does. Everybody loves green beans because you're from Iowa. No. No. Okay. No. All right. You are from Iowa and you like vegetables. Submit to my teaching. No. <laughs> okay, so think about it. You have two green bean plants. You plant them both at the same time. A month and a half later, they both grow up. This green bean plant grows up to be this monster of green bean plant, right? It's like basically a tree. It's producing thousands of green beans a day. And it has, and these green beans are incredible, and they're so yummy. The other plant is just normal, right? It's just an average green bean plant. It's producing, I don't know, 10 green beans a day. Don't quote me on that. But it's still these amazing, delicious green beans. What do they have in common? Common. Delicious, amazing green beans, right? Okay, as Christians, as truly born again Christians, we're not expected to all be giant trees that produce crazy amounts of fruit. We're not all called to be a Pastor Pat who's leading people to Christ, who's preaching on Sundays. But we are all called to be producing these good fruits. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness. And so I just want to encourage you guys not to be comparing yourselves um, in your walk with the Lord. We all have times that are rough, and we all have times that are really great, and we see a lot of good fruit being produced in our life. But remember that you're not, you're not known, you're not defined by the amount of fruit you produce, but about the type of fruit you produce. You're not defined by the how loving, how how much people you love, how much people you you care for, but you 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 are defined if you do love people and you do care for people, and that's signs of God working in your life and giving you a heart like His. Um, also, as Christians that are maturing, we see God opportunities grow. 
you see people who are mature in the faith. You mentioned Pastor Pat, you see Jerry, Andrew. These guys have been, been born again. They've been Christians for a long time. Do you think they would not be serving if they um, if, if they were Christians? If they, okay, they are Christians. <laughs> what I'm trying to say is, as a Christian, you should be serving. Yeah? You should be serving. You shouldn't say you're a Christian and say you're growing spiritually and then choose to not share that with others and choose to not show people these fruit of the spirits that are growing in you. Serve. If you're born again, a sign of maturity is service. Glorifying God with the gifts that he's given you. Um, seek opportunities to grow. All right, wrap it up. What did we learn? Chapter 5, verses 11 through 14. Our nature is to be like that. We are naturally unattracted to the Word of God. We naturally don't care about the fact that Christ died for our sins. We naturally want to stay in this spot of immaturity, just living life how we want to. That's our nature, is to be immature. Our nature is to be immature. Number two, how does maturity begin? With that first act of repentance. With that first time you say, God, I'm stuck in sin, and I keep falling into the same sin, but I know that you are the only one that can even get me to move on from that. You're the only one who can save me from that and free me of these thorns that are covering me up to the place that I want to be at, which is freedom from this, all this dissatisfaction. God is that satisfaction. So maturity begins with acknowledging you're a sinner and humbling yourself before God, confessing your sin. And thirdly, maturity produces good fruit. So once you are born again, you've laid that foundation, you should see fruit in your life. And if you don't, you need to be asking yourself, which one of these defines me more? The attitudes of an immature person to the attitudes of someone who's mature and is growing in their faith. We never arrive. We never arrive as Christians. So don't expect perfection out of yourself. And because God doesn't expect perfection out of you. Um, but are you a spiritually mature person? Think about that. Um, and think about which one of these describes you most. Sweet. Um, let's pray. God, thank you uh, for your word and for the time at youth group that we can all focus and listen to what you have to say. And it's not of our own knowledge, but it's of the knowledge that you give us. And God, I, I thank you that you mature us, but you don't expect perfection out of us. God, and, um, what a blessing that is. And I just ask that tonight as... These, these kids leave and they think the question, am I spiritually mature, that they would find which spot they identify with the most. Are they immature? Do they not know you, God? Um, do they need to take that first step of laying the foundation of repenting and coming to you? Or are they, are they Christians and do they need to be seeing what their next step is? Is it baptism, God, or... Um, serving. I just ask that you would keep that in our hearts and our minds tonight as we go into small groups. Pray in the Son's name. Amen.